Uh, there's a lot of studies that say shark populations or, or increase in shark biomass actually increases fish populations and fish biomass too. So, so it, more sharks doesn't necessarily mean less fish, quite counterintuitively. In this week's episode of the Ocean Pancake Podcast, we talk to Holly Richmond, who is a marine biologist and director of the Shark Net film, and Andre, who is a film director and filmmaker of Envoy Cull. We have a really great conversation talking about all things about the longest running marine cull in the world. Did you know that it started in 1937? And from then till now, all up and down the east coast of Australia, New South Wales and Queensland governments have been culling sharks. I'm just very excited to share this with you guys. Holly Richmond's movie is already up on YouTube, so make sure to head on over to the Ocean Pancake group where you can join the Ocean Warriors and check the movie out with the rest of us. Otherwise, if you could help support me in continuing doing the work I do, which is spreading information and education and science about our oceans and helping people to protect it, it would mean the world to me if you became a patron or you got yourself a Plastic is the Killer t-shirt. Head on over to oceanpancake.com um, for that and all the show notes, all the details from this podcast, all the social medias of Holly and Andre, as well as information about the films. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you're staying safe. I hope your family is okay. Sending lots of love and wishes during this scary time. Every day, there's a new news story about the crisis facing our ocean, whether it's the plastic issue, overfishing, pollution. If the oceans die, we die. Fortunately, we have plenty of environmental activists, marine conservationists, and eco-warriors who are out there every day fighting to protect our oceans and our Earth. On the Ocean Pancake Podcast, we're going to be hearing from some of them about how to decrease our environmental footprint, go plastic-free, participate in ocean conservation, cleanups, and even maybe some marine science. So, welcome to the Ocean Pancake Podcast, where the goal is sustainability and living a turquoise life. My name is Kat Andreskova, and I'm your host today. Let's get into this week's episode. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Ocean Pancake Podcast. Today, I am joined by Holly Richmond and... Andre Burrell, who are marine biologists uh, and filmmaker, respectively, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Pleased to be you. here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you guys here, and it's great that we can get all three of us here at the same time, even during this quarantine time. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly times. <laughs> interesting times, but the beauty of technology, hey? Yeah, so... Luckily, um, the podcast situation hasn't changed much, but even if the outside world has, but this gives us a great opportunity to chat about all the amazing work that's happening in the field. So I wanted to just start a little bit um, about you guys. So Holly, could you just let us know, how did you first fall in love with the ocean? What brought you to working with ocean conservation and becoming a marine biologist? Yeah, well, I pretty much grew up pretty close to nature. I travel around Australia um, when I was younger and yeah, just had the opportunity to be in and around the ocean um, for those early years of my life. And I guess the moment that I really sort of fell in love with the ocean was, um, you know, the, the first couple of times of putting your head under the water um, through those snorkeling masks and being able to see exactly what is under the ocean. So um, definitely my first snorkeling um, experience as a young child um, is what brought that interest and passion towards it. Um, but as I grew a little bit older, I think I was about seven years old and traveling around Australia, um, we found eight dead sea turtles in one day on Morton Island. And oh no. these turtles, yeah, these turtles had just washed up and one of them was starting to, um, decompose and you could see plastic in their stomachs and that was really confronting for me um, as a young girl to see that so um, 
that's when I did my first sort of beach clean and started to really get um, involved in ocean conservation and, um, you know, trying to tackle a lot of different um, issues that our oceans um, are faced with. That's great. What about you, Andre? Yeah, so my story's uh, a little bit different. I grew up in Brisbane, so not, not near the beach, unfortunately, but we always used to holiday uh, at either the Sunshine Coast or the Gold Coast, which is an hour north or an hour south. So um, always around the ocean growing up, but just in small, small bursts. Um, and uh, I think really that, that was mainly going to the beach and bodyboarding and, and, and all those norm, you know, kind of normal beach activities. I think what made me fall in love with marine life though was somewhere I'd never go now. But um, as a kid, my parents took me to, at the time it was called Underwater World uh, mm -hmm. in, in, on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, it's called something else now. And going through the tunnel where you can basically go under the glass dome and, and see sharks uh, and all sorts of all sorts of fish, and that's kind of made what made me fall in love with marine life, other than other than loving the beach already. So um, yeah, not somewhere I'd go now, but I guess uh, yeah, it, it it did spark what turned into kind of a lifelong fascination for me, and and I think I'm a story of someone who's sort of a slow burn to to actually doing something about it. So um, I've always liked it and found it fascinating. And then you start watching documentaries and you start learning more. And I started to go scuba diving and then I cared more and I wanted to do something. And then I did a little, uh, now making this film, I feel like I'm doing more. Uh, and then uh, after this, um, after this, I think I've found that I just want to do everything, everything I can. So you start with a little, then you do a bit mm -hmm. more than a lot. And then now I feel like I just want to do everything to, to, help sharks and, and help the ocean. I can definitely relate to that. I mean, I went, um, I lived in Brisbane for about six years, so I went to university there. Uh, and that's kind of where my love affair with sharks and even more so began just earlier on. Like I didn't really know what was going on. And then I got to dive with the gray nurse sharks down there and just, you know, become part of the Australian lifestyle. So I, I know what you guys are talking about. Very jealous, by the way, that you guys got to grow up near the beach. <laughs> um, it is a blessing. It is a yeah. blessing. A lot of people would give their give their left arm to do it, and I think we a lot of Australians take it for granted. So, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it, it, you're jealous of of us. I'm jealous of Holly, who got to spend her whole life in that area. So yeah, we've all got someone to be jealous. Of. <laughs> and Holly is just all the yep. the end. <laughs> um. How did the first kind of the issue of the sharks come up for you guys, right? Because Envoy is um, a film about the shark call currently happening in New South Wales and Queensland. And it is something I found out quite recently. I mean, four years into me living in Brisbane. How did you guys learn about that? Yeah, well, um, I'll get started on this one, but... I worked for a couple of years as a research assistant um, during my studies um, monitoring humpback whales that migrate past the east coast of Australia and mm -hmm. um, going out there and researching and IDing these individual humpback whales. Um, generally, people see on the news each year humpback whale entanglements and that's something yeah. that is a pretty big highlight of the shark control program that really gets out to people because people don't generally hear about it any other time of the year. Um, so basically, yeah, that was a question I, that I kept asking myself and, okay, what are these shark nets? What are they doing? I, I can see these whales that I'm so passionate about and researching. They're getting um, intercepted by these shark nets each time they come to visit. So that's, I guess, what led me into the interest and in learning about it. Um, more and more and I guess that's when I took the initiative to go out there and um, really observe and monitor exactly um, what is going on there because it's very hard when you look at statistics on the screen or you hear things um, presented from the government or on social media it's very hard to grasp exactly um, what it was for me and going out there myself and being able to document everything that was happening really gave me such a greater understanding of the program in the methods and what exactly it's um, doing. I think Holly, Holly's right there in that, that you kind of have to see it um, mm -hmm. to really get it and, and get how barbaric and terrible it is. And, and that's kind of how I became aware of it. So I 
I actually became aware of it through social media, following Sea Shepherd and then following Sea Shepherd's Apex Harmony campaign, which is their mm-hmm. uh, their chapter uh, that specifically relates to documenting the the um, shark control program. So following them on social media, and when you see an image, uh, obviously an image on a phone is different to um, going out uh, going out and documenting it yourself, uh, like how Holly became aware of it. But um, seeing an even just seeing an image of on a phone of of a manta ray tangled and dying and, and things you've dived with that are just so beautiful and, and seeing them either an image or a video of them struggling for life or taking their last breaths that that's how I became aware of it was through social media and it just made me really 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 mad like I couldn't believe this was a thing that we're doing in in the 21st century uh, and then you start to peel back layers and you start to realize how absolutely absurd it is and you get angrier and angrier so i guess i became yeah i became aware of it through social media and then got sparked into action just by being so frustrated and mad that this could be going on yeah i actually have a full episode where i talk to the leader of apex harmony a jonathan clark Jono, yes. Yeah. He's in he's, our film as well. He's, yeah. am, he's amazing. Um, but yeah, we talk for a full hour about the work he's done, which because he's gone up and down the entire coast collecting data because what he wants to do essentially is bring transparency, what the government isn't telling us about how many numbers of these manta rays and harmless creatures are getting caught and tangled. Luckily, as you were saying, Holly, the humpback whales are getting that media kind of platform you know that people care when a humpback whale gets tangled and that's really the times that people get frustrated while they don't care if or most people care less if it's like a turtle tangled or a manta tangled um and yeah so jonathan's doing this amazing work so i i definitely know what you're talking about i also saw it on social media and i actually got to go out on the boat and see this firsthand and as you're saying it's horrific (laughs) <laughs> there's there's a lot of people like holly and, and and jono out there doing doing amazing work and that that's really what i guess in essence what the film is is about is is shining the biggest brightest spotlight we can on both the program but also the people out there um that are working to bring transparency or bring change or whatever it might be um that's really what we've tried to achieve from the film is is uh we're, we're not saying that uh we're not trying to position ourselves as um, anything other than shining a spotlight on the amazing people doing the amazing work. Beautiful. So that's kind of the whole mission of the movie is to, to let people know what's going on and who's working um, to protect our oceans. Yeah. And it's the reason behind the title. We didn't have the title when we started, we really, we, we had a working title, but we weren't sure what we were going to name it. But then meeting people like Holly, meeting people like Jono and some of the other people that are, that are yet to be announced, meeting some of these people and seeing the amount of work they put into exposing this and the heartache they go through and, and just the, the really messed up things they see um, in order to, to bring transparency to this. Um, you know, the, the way we see it is that they're, they're on a mission to, to, basically speak up for these animals and, and I guess be their envoy. And that's how we ended up uh, naming it. We, we essentially named it after these people that feature in the film and are doing amazing work. So yeah, it, it, it is, um, a, few, a few of the cast members have, have already been announced. There's a few more to come. Uh, and yeah, it, it's about them and it's about the program. So highlighting their good work in exposing just the atrocities of the program. So this program, it is the longest running marine cull um, happening right now in New South Wales and Queensland. Can you tell me what is it? Why is it happening for those uh, listeners who do not know? Yeah, so um, when you look at the New South Wales and the Queensland programs as one, um, they're run by different states. They're ever so slightly different, but, but both... The intention of both is to remove sharks from the ecosystem. So they're a cull by definition. Uh, New South Wales started in 1937. Queensland started in 1932. Um, There was actually a two-year trial uh, prior to the New South Wales one actually starting. So you could technically call it 1935. Um, And yeah, there basically hasn't been a day that we haven't been culling sharks between those two states uh, since then. So we can't find a longer cull on 
on record anywhere. Um, it is a marine cull. It's almost the longest cull in the world. Uh, since 1930, they've been culling coyotes in, in uh, the US. So it almost actually holds the title of the world's longest cull full stop. Uh, but not quite. <laughs> I'm not sure how proud they can be of that or, or, or not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it doesn't quite hold that title, but very, very, very close. And um, yeah, I'll look, I, I was just mind blown that, that it's been running this long and, and essentially hasn't evolved and it's just ineffective. There's been small evolutions. New South Wales take their nets out during whale season now. Queensland don't. Uh, New South Wales has moved to smart drum lines, um, which are slightly better than traditional drum lines. But really, it's the same program since 1935, same technology since 1935. Uh, and its sole purpose is to reduce the populations of sharks. So it's a cult. Uh, in terms of the methods, uh, maybe distinguishing between nets and drum lines, I might hand over to, to, to Holly maybe to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, basically in Queensland, um, we have 27 shark nets and 383 drum lines. And, um, so a shark net is something that um, a lot of people sort of misinterpret exactly what that is. A lot of people um, imagine that as a barrier between um, the shoreline where you swim and where um, the sharks are um, obviously swimming up in the deeper depths. So shark nets are about 200 metres long um, and they're about six metres deep. So they're basically a gill net. So any old sort of fishing net device, it's got a 50 centimetre gap uh, mesh size. Um, and it's basically designed to, hence the word gill net, um, is to entangle sharks, the purpose, and to wrap them around their gills and to be able to um, sort of drown these animals. So believe it or not, sharks can drown. Um, they need that oxygen through their gills to survive. So when an animal is entangled, they obviously stress out, wrap themselves up in that net, um, and they're no longer able to move anymore. Um, so obviously putting a net out there in the ocean, especially um, along the east coast of Australia, we have such a diversity of marine species. Um, you're gonna catch a lot more, if not more than sharks. Um, so uh, I'll talk about drum lines now, but drum lines is a baited hook um, that is positioned um, about four to six meters um, deep in the water that is uh, baited with either shark flesh or mullet um, that is there to capture and to kill sharks. So generally the, um, throughout the Queensland coastline, um, the nets are positioned parallel to the beach um, and they're alternating drum lines and nets. Um, nets are positioned pretty much on the southern end of Queensland, um, but the use of drum lines is all throughout um, the Queensland coastline. Yeah, I think there are um, extensive maps and things that anyone who's listening can check out to see how many drum lines or nets there are up and down the coast. I remember I was, I was in Cairns this time last year and I was talking to my friends there who were all diving instructors, marine biologists, and they had no idea that those big yellow boys, uh, you know, a couple hundred meters off the beaches were drum lines. So it's while considering how long this call has been happening it's relatively unknown no one talks about it really um and i find that really shocking you know especially people in our field who are in the ocean all the time aren't aware that all up and down the coast i mean you, you said the number what was it 300 and 83 drum lines 383 drum lines so 383 hooks which are baited with shark or mullet to capture sharks essentially but we have seen according to um, Sea Shepherd and Jonathan of course the amazing work they do uh, and you should check it out on Facebook you can see photos they have captured not only sharks on those um, hooks but also turtles and I've when I was out on the boat I saw a dolphin going up to those hooks and was almost getting caught on it so it's really scary um how we, many creatures are getting caught we have some very very distressing footage that was given to us um of a baby dolphin 
gut hooked mm. on on a drum line and the mum trying to push it to the surface to breathe um it's it's not nice to watch but i think it's important for people to see the the, the one that there's lay there's so many layers to this one of those is exactly what you touched on which is um they catch sharks which is their target which is an absurd absurd in itself they catch other marine animals whatever it might be do, dolphins turtles which is horrendous the the third the, the third part that i think isn't spoken about enough is that once they've caught something they then attract much larger sharks this is the terrifying thing we've been through data that we obtained through freedom of information um and when they when they record their catch they have to leave a comment and we've found 400 ish cases where a smaller shark a reef shark or something like that has been bitten in half just a head left um bitten off behind the pectoral fins like and uh, that's a large animal that's going to do that so um the the cases of a small harmless shark to, to to swimmers or surfers who were allegedly trying to protect here um being caught is then attracting much 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 bigger animals so when you when you to just to go back to where you mentioned there's there's maps available of where these are that's 100 percent right queensland government website um you can go and see all down to the level of gps coordinates you can go see all the beaches and exact locations of these drum lines the amount of them that are at surf beaches and surf breaks te terrifies me like it it, it mm -hmm. i think if people knew they would be choosing not to surf or swim there because when you understand that there's a boy just out there that's baited and then it's going to attract sharks to that bait. And then if a little shark's caught, it's going to attract much, much bigger sharks to that shark. That's a terrifying thought to swim near. So uh, it, it, it want, the more you dig, the more it blows your mind. And Holly's, Holly's seen, seen similar instances of this, the nets acting the same way. So something entangled in a net, then has a chunk out of it holly you might want to talk about that that case that's in that's in your film yeah absolutely i can definitely um i'm one of those witnesses that have seen one of those scary moments of realization of an animal being caught in a net um and what amazed me was how um particular this shark was able to bite around this animal without being entangled. So um, this animal, it was a shovel nose ray. It was about two meters, um, pretty big. And it was hanging at the surface paradise net on the Gold Coast. And it was hanging there with massive uh, bite marks out of it. So obviously um, a shark has come along, found it, predated upon it. Um, but another important factor is that that shark didn't get caught in the shark net, not in any of the shark nets in, on the Gold Coast. So what is that telling you? That's telling you that you're luring an animal closer um, and these animals have outsmarted the technology, you know, um, and been able to feed um, and then move on without becoming entangled. So that's, that was a very scary realisation of what's exactly happening out there. I know um, there's been cases, yeah, with rays caught in nets and a shark has come in to eat the ray and um they've been caught in there as well in the data you can see um when a dolphin's gone in and all these other sharks have gone into the same net as well to feast on that dolphin so it's yeah it's crazy once you get into it and um of course i'm not 100 percent sure i'm not a marine biologist but i have heard that sharks respond to injured fish or stressed out fish in the water because that uh, sends out signals and they're quite receptive to that. So I would imagine if there is a smaller shark caught in, or any creature caught in a net or a drum line, you know, they're thrashing about, they're exhausted, they're stressed out. That's sending out those messages like, hey, here, come here. <laughs> there's, there's a dinner basically. Yeah, absolutely. And not even, and if that animal passes away in that net, mm -hmm. then you're looking at a chemical attraction. The mm -hmm. smell of that rotting carcass, for example, like a tiger shark, which are really opportunistic scavengers, that's an easy feed for them. So obviously they're gonna come in and have a look. 
Now I have to interrupt the podcast for a little shout out to the sponsor of this podcast, which is Modi Body, a feminine hygiene brand perfect for all you ladies who want to protect our oceans and our sharks. Gentlemen, the best thing you can do is stop eating fish and stop contributing to the plastic. However, every female contributes around 130 kilograms of plastic single-use waste just from our monthly cycle. So I highly recommend you check out the sustainable, ethical alternative. Head on over to Modi Body, use the code VEGANDIVER10 for a discount of 10% for your first purchase. Head on over and help the oceans by helping yourself be more comfortable and yeah, uh, help the sharks. Uh, how many big sharks are getting caught right because they these calls they say they have target species which by itself is i don't know how many sharks are on their target list there's 19 is it 19 holly last i checked it was about 1918 i think so yeah, yeah. not 19 on the target list i mean um Bulls, tigers, whites are the three you'd expect to see on there. They're, mm-hmm. they're what, um, uh, you know, that they are ones that, that if there's a mistaken identity by it, they, they do damage. But there's, there's, there's so many others on there that have never been responsible for, um, you know, any serious damage to a human being. So, so the, the, the sheer fact that there's 19 on that target list um, is insane. And then when you dive into the statistics of how many, um, how many they're killing since the program started just queensland data we're still waiting on our freedom of information request from new south wales um uh to come through for, for some data on that but um uh, just queensland data something like thirteen thousand tiger sharks uh, since the start of this program so uh, just an insane number of of an animal that is already under pressure for other reasons to take to take out of the ecosystem and of course, they, they do say they have um, size, minimum size limits. So I, I read that, you know, they're aiming to get these big sharks, which could potentially be dangerous to humans. But even the small sharks they catch die, most likely, you know, because they do leave those hooks baited for three days or even more, or they don't check them that often. So even by the point when they get out there, the, the creatures are dead. I mean, we saw that with Jono on the Sea Shepherd boat um, every time, which is heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. They, um, like I said before, they're drowning in these nets and it mm-hmm. doesn't take very long, it takes a couple of minutes. Um, and so if you're a shark in a net that's alive, you're a pretty lucky shark unless you're on the target list. So um, generally they say over two meters is a potential threat to human safety um, due to an animal's size um, and the damage that they could do um, in the unlikelihood that they would bite someone. Um, But looking at that, um, if it's a target shark species, so for example, if it's a tiger shark that is less than two meters, Um, In Queensland, I know um, that animal will still be uh, killed because eventually that animal is going to grow up and be a mature adult so um, and be larger than two metres. So um, the mind frame that they've got is if it's a target species, um, obviously that needs to be caught and killed. Um, For example, if you had a a pregnant tiger shark um, that was still alive, she would be euthanised and cut open. All her pups would be counted and killed. Um, and dumped offshore um, to decompose. So it's, it's definitely trying to wipe out those species of um, animals that do migrate past or um, are residential around um, our coastlines um, in saying that as well, that, um, oh, I've lost track. That's right. You can cut it there. <laughs> here's, the, here's the insane thing about, about, this as well the wa cull or trial of a cull it was a cull mm-hmm. that um that happened in 2014 it was actually a lot it, it got global attention and global outrage right yeah. we had paddle outs about it there was there was it, it was yeah it was big news it was actually a lot more humane than this cull Why there was that? there was there was less target species mm-hmm. and they only they were only killing animals above three meters. Now, as your point, to, to your point, yes, animals smaller than that often died because they were they were hanging 
on a drum line for a long time or whatever it might be, or, or they were just handled so poorly by fisheries that, that they would die from, from injuries, even if they were below three meters. But the intention of the program w- was almost uh, somewhat more humane in that it only wanted to kill, I believe it was three species of sharks and, bull- and, and large sharks. This program has been running for 60 something years in Queensland, 80 something years um, in, in New South Wales. And it's seeking to kill a lot more animals and animals of any size down to pups, exactly like Holly said. And, and no one's really aware of it and no one seems to say boo. So again, that's, that's our intention out of this is to shine the biggest spotlight we can, we can make uh, on this because I think once people understand what the program is, the, the, the outrage we saw for WA should be tenfold. I, it's mind blowing. So just quickly, why is it so important that we protect sharks more than other species? I mean, we definitely don't hear any outrage about other types of fishing. So why are sharks so crucial to the ecosystems? Yeah, well, I guess all species um, play their own specific role in the ocean and they all are really important species, but sharks in particular, um, those uh, larger species, their role as apex predators are crucial to a functioning and healthy ecosystem. So I like to kind of refer them as the white blood cells of the ocean. So they pretty much pick up off the dying, the dead, the weak, um, and just leaving those healthiest fish and animals to survive and reproduce and therefore um, formulating a really healthy ocean, just like what the white blood cells do in our bodies as well. So um, a really good example, like I said before, the tiger shark being an op- opportunistic scavenger uh, will feed on pretty much anything. And without that tiger shark, you're going to have a really big and catastrophic top-down effect on the ecosystem. So um, reef sharks, for example, um, if we were to wipe out all the reef sharks, we would have a lot more larger predatory fish, um, for example, as gropers um, that would increase in population size because nobody's there to feed on them. Um, And then with that increase in population size of the gropers, they're pretty much going to wipe out those smaller herbivorous fish that feed on the algae. Um, So we know we're going to get an overpopulation um, of algae abundance and that can generally cover coral reef systems or um, formulate sort of like a dead reef over time. So um, and we know that coral reefs are, are the backbone to our ecosystem, to um, reef system. So you can really see by taking out just one species or just one type of um, predator, you're really going to get that top-down effect right down to the seagrass beds or right down to those coral um, on the bottom of the ocean that formulate such strong and powerful ecosystems. So these these animals, these sharks have been around for about 450 million years. So their role in the ocean is pretty important and clearly they've been around longer than what we have, longer before trees. We need to keep them there because their role is obviously showing their importance just by how long they've been around. Yeah. Now, I want to play a little bit of the devil's advocate because I get these questions a lot and I just wanted to see what your perspective was on the opinion. So we have a lot of fishing happening. We have commercial fishing, we have recreational fishing, but all up and down the coast, Australia is a big fan of fishing, which means that a lot of our fish stock populations are heavily pressured. And um, one of the things that I get asked is, well, if all these stocks are being fished or overfished potentially, doesn't it make sense that we also call sharks to try and keep the balance? Because otherwise, if there's, you know, less fish, more sharks, wouldn't that mean that sharks would potentially go out of their usual food chains um, to find food? So I'll take this first and then, and then, um, and then Holly might like to chime in. So there's, there's a few there's a few ways to attack this question one one is 
a cull that a government is trying to hide and trying to keep from you, mm -hmm. um, I think is a, regardless of, of, you know, fish numbers and those kinds of things, I'll come back to that. A cull that a government is trying to keep hidden from the public, um, I, I think is bad news in, in a, in a developed country with a democracy. I don't think that governments should be keeping programs quiet like this. Um, as they clearly attempt to do. I think that's just a bad, bad path to, to accept and, and, and not try and do something about that. So in that respect, I think drawing attention to this, to this culling program is important because I, I think someone needs to keep, keep governments in check. And, and mm -hmm. in this respect, it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily always being done. And when it is tried to be done by organisations like Sea Shepherd, they essentially try and gag put a gag order on them by putting new rules in place, make it hard to do what they're doing. So I, I think that's a really, really dangerous path for governments to go down. I think it needs mm -hmm. to be highlighted and something done about it from, from that perspective. In terms of fish numbers, I mean, there's a lot of studies. Uh, there's a lot of studies. Holly, you might like to chime in here if, if you know the specifics. Uh, there's a lot of studies that say shark populations or, or increase in shark biomass actually increases fish populations and fish biomass too. So, so it, more sharks doesn't necessarily mean less fish quite counterintuitively. Um, it's, it's sometimes, uh, it, it can be the opposite. Uh, so, so there's that. The, the other argument too is, um, you know, is this an issue worth focusing, uh, focusing on? Um, because fishing is, is say the bigger issue. Um, I agree for, for, for sharks like reef sharks, for example, commercial fishing would take more sharks uh, for, for finning reasons or, or, or whatever it might be um, than this program does. But the larger animals, um, I think this program is a big threat to your, your great hammerheads, your tigers, your, your great whites. They can't, great white can't be commercially fished because it's, it's protected species. The others, the other large animals don't make commercial sense to, to target for, for fins because they take up more space on the boat, et cetera, et cetera. So for big animals, uh, for, for the big animals and, and they're especially low, slow to reproduce for the big animals. I think this program is a, is a huge threat, maybe, maybe more than it's given credit for you know, for, for your smaller species of shark, quite likely commercial fishing is the bigger threat, but does that, that to me doesn't mean we should ignore this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Holly, you had anything to add on, yeah, on that. Yeah, just going to, just going to say that you summarized that pretty well. So yeah, I think so too. <laughs> um, I would love to have you Holly send through any of those studies that you have, which I like, as you put it, Andre, the more sharks does not mean less fish. I think that would be a really good resource to be able to share with people and have available on the ocean pancake uh, website, just to, to give that as an answer to the people who ask this question, because I get it a lot. So I just wanted an extra, <laughs> an extra set of um, viewpoints on it. Yeah, absolutely. So you have this film coming out. When is it coming out? What can we look forward to? Like, what else can you tell us about it? Sure. So um, it's coming out uh, at the moment. Obviously, coronavirus is throwing a lot of people's plans uh, for when they wanted to release a film up in the air a little bit. So oh, yeah. I'll tell you what the plan was, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll do a shameless plug for our social media where you can keep up to date just in case that changes. Uh, so we, we were going to have a premiere on June 5 uh, in Coolangatta. Coolangatta is right on the New South Wales and Queensland border. Um, on the beach seemed an appropriate place to to um, premiere this film. So we were going to have a June 5 premiere uh, of this film. We're going to have public along. We we're going to have our stars of the film along. That obviously depends on where we're at with um, public gatherings and social distancing and so on and so forth. So that is the current plan. And we're probably going to stick with that for another month until, until we know uh, whether that can happen or not. When that doesn't, if that can't happen, um, check out our social media for what our plan B is going to be. We, we may pivot to a digital release. We may, if we think the, the social distancing and public gatherings is going to be lifted not long thereafter, we might just bump the premiere a little bit and still have a, still have a physical um, premiere. Uh, but if, if there's no end in sight, we might 
you know, shift plans a little bit as a lot of people are having to do and go to a digital, a digital premiere and a digital release. So um, that's the amount of detail I can give you at the moment because everything's so up in the air. Uh, but if, if I'm sure you'll put the links in the show notes, but yeah. if you look for Envoy Cull uh, on uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you should be able to, you should be able to find us there. You'll put the, I'm sure you'll put the exact handles in the show notes yeah. or the exact links in the show notes. You have a TikTok. Uh, yeah, we have a TikTok. We, we're tr- we're trying to reach that young demographic, um, which which apparently apparently to you know that that twelve to eighteen, twelve to sixteen, twelve to eighteen, um, Instagram's not cool and Facebook's definitely not cool. So oh, um, yeah, we got a TikTok. Uh, we got a TikTok where we're putting out some serious content um, to to you know make the younger demographic aware of what's going on, uh, and also uh, we're going to start putting some some funny and playful stuff on there. Um, Maybe to create like, like a it. like a shark po- dance challenge we could do that yeah we're also going to poke <laughs> a little bit of fun at the uh the policy makers that think this program's a good idea so um just a little bit of light-hearted fun uh at their expense um but uh <laughs> we're going to keep it we're going to keep it professional and put some facts on there as well because i think that's a critical demographic there's a lot of um uh, yeah I think it's Sweden uh, where they were trying to uh, many years ago, it, it was a Scandinavian country. I might be getting it wrong, but um, uh, they wanted to bring in recycling and make recycling popular in that country. And they were getting nowhere, getting nowhere, getting nowhere. Then they put an education program um, to that younger demographic. Mm-hmm. They then are pr- proud to go home from school and tell their parents um, what they've learned about recycling and, and that, that you should be recycling too. And they actually generated the most change through that young gem- de- demographic telling their parents what to do and, and what the reality of the situation is. So um, yeah, it sounds a bit odd that we're on TikTok, but I, I personally see that younger demographic as super, super critical in this, in this whole space and a lot of spaces. Oh, definitely. Um, now, now you make me want to get a TikTok. <laughs> You could lose a lot of time on there. Be careful. You go down this wormhole of funny and funny videos and dance videos, and occasionally you'll come across something about the shark cull. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's the stuff I would want to see. I don't. That's depressing. Anyway, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Hopefully, you guys can have that physical physical a premiere. But maybe if it is pushed back by a month or so, I could make it because i'm planning to be on the east coast in august so that would be amazing so i'll definitely be following you guys on social medias all of these links are going to be on the ocean pancake website uh in the show notes as well as you know all all the places (laughs) in in the meantime till it's out too you should definitely check out holly's film so holly stars in our film but she actually put together her own film on on this topic as well um so holly give that a plug would you Uh, cheers thanks um yeah so i released my film uh what are we 2020 um mid last year Mm -hmm. so it's going pretty well it's easily accessible on youtube on vimeo on our facebook page as well um basically out there just to reach as many people as we can so feel free to um go watch that give it a like give it a share um and try and uh, spread that message further to everybody around us I'm just trying to look it up now because I'm definitely just going to share it in the Facebook group and everything. Um, speaking of which, if you're listening and you're not in the Facebook group, make sure to head on over there because it's a great place where a whole bunch of ocean warriors share um, all sorts of things. Oh, here we go. The Sharknet film Gold Coast. Beautiful. Is that? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So it's just about like a 30 minute film. Um, I spent two years documenting and observing the shark control program on the Gold Coast um, in Queensland. So I've put a, um, about a 30 minute film together, just explaining, um, helping educate people, inspire people and motivate people to, to want to care and help promote change to this program. I think Holly's talking it down a little bit there. It's really, it's really, really, um, it's really good. Um, don't say it's just, just a 30 minute film. It's a great, it's a really, really powerful short film. You should definitely check it out. And it uh, obviously Holly's two years of hard work and passion for this forms one story arc within our feature length film. But um, yeah, ch- check hers out. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, a lot of emotion went into the two years and into this film. So hopefully you guys will be able to watch it. Yeah, I've just found it. I'm going to be sharing it everywhere. Thank you guys so much. Um, I just want to finish off the podcast, how I always finish it off, which is 
what is the one piece of advice that you would give to people who want to help protect our oceans? Yeah, I don't mind starting this one, but basically my key message, um, and you'll hear this in my film as well, um, but education is key. And as cheesy as that sounds, it's so, so important because how would we know about anything if we weren't informed by anyone? And um, so my biggest um, piece of advice to everybody and anybody is making it a conversation. So obviously sharks come up um, in our media all the time or, um, well, I do because obviously I love the ocean. So I share a lot of um, ocean related things. Um, but these topics that do come up, um, for example, like a whale entanglement that you might see on the news, um, definitely bring that up with other people and help educate those people and not in a, um, in intense way, just, just opening up their mind to exactly what the program is and why sharks are important and why sharks are um, reducing in numbers um, and all of that. So definitely making it a conversation with your friends and with your family. Um, like you guys were chatting about TikTok, um, social media is good for so many things and also bad for so many things as well. But mm -hmm. um, definitely utilizing those resources to reach out. We can reach almost anybody on this world with the access of the internet. We're so, so lucky to be able to have that outreach um, to people that we don't even know. Um, so by sharing and um, sharing links to this film as well and to envoy the film, all of this is gonna help with ed education um, and promote positive change towards that program. Um, so we just wanna start those ripples. Um, that's our goal here is, like Andre said, shedding light to that program um, and then um, the rest will follow with sharing it with everyone. I agree, I agree with Holly wholeheartedly in that conversations are powerful. Like the amount of, our film's not even out yet, but just, just the amount of conversations I've had from telling people what, what project we're working on at the moment and, um, uh, and then they've never heard of it and then you explain it to them and they understand how ridiculous it is. So conversations are powerful, but uh, just so that I'm not saying exactly the same thing, I would probably say, and this is from personal experience, whatever you're doing, um, just consciously always try and do a little more. Like I said, at the very, very start of the interview, I'm, uh, I'm someone who started by doing a little uh, and then did a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and eventually went, I'm going to make a film. And now once this film's done, it's all I want to do. So uh, I would just say, always try and do a little more that for wherever you're at right now, just always try and up the ante a little bit, do a little bit more. If you're liking posts about something uh, that you're passionate about, start sharing or commenting. If you're already doing that, and you can afford to maybe start donating if you can if you can start volunteering some of your time like wherever you're at always just just try and you know as you grow as a person and as you uh, progress through life just just try and do more because no one should be mad at you for not being the world's leading conservationist right now today mm -hmm. uh, but as long as you're consciously always trying to make a bit more of an effort and and give you a little bit of yourself uh, to a cause, I, th I think that's all we can do. That's beautifully put. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me here today. I really enjoyed having the chance to chat to you and have an extra set of opinions about the whole longest running marine cult in the world. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you once again, and hopefully we can chat soon, uh, maybe after the film's released and see like what the reception was, what's happening with the government, if they're listening, um, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yep. Count, count me in. I'm definitely, uh, yeah. Cannot wait to, to finish this project. Cannot get it out for the world to see. Hopefully we stimulate some change and, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk again. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you guys. That was an incredible hour of my life. As Andre said, we could have kept talking about this for 10 hours, but unfortunately we had to cut it down. But I do think we're going to have Holly and Andre back again. Holly may be for an Oceans Today episode. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to send me an email or a message letting me know what you'd like to learn from a marine biologist focused on humpback whales and now helping to protect sharks. As always, I also want to say thank you to Graham Mose, who is the mind behind the music in this podcast. Podcast. He is in Brisbane 
and usually you can see him live there but for now everything's online so check him out and Graham Mo's music and yeah support the arts it's a hard time for everyone right now sending love hope you're doing well hope your family is doing well and I'll talk to you next time